Jim Nickelbein. I'm the director at uh, Woodland Dunes. Uh, we do a lot of habitat work. Uh, we've worked with, with Tom back there on some interesting projects. Um, uh, that's cool that uh, Friends of North Point, I, I remember coming to North Point a few years ago to see a purple sandpiper. Uh, we were all excited about that. So that's a special place. So I'm gonna talk about uh, just wildlife in your backyard. This is just general, uh, some general ecology about backyards, but um, you know, all, all places, uh, including our yards, are, uh, are components of the ecosystem. And people don't think of that. Uh, people, wow, wow. what an echo. I don't know, it just popped up. Nice. <laughs> um, People overlook their backyards as ecosystems, uh, but actually, uh, you know, and we think of these big places like national parks and, and things like that, but there's a lot of land, you know, that is privately owned that's, that's just in our backyard, just small parcels, and they can all be improved uh, for wildlife, and it's amazing what can show up there. And ecosystems that have more components are generally more stable. Uh, they're, they're generally less disrupted by some of the other things that, that people do, invasive species and things like that. So, and I have to throw in a, a quote from Aldo Leopold. You always have to do that if you're giving a, uh, a talk about this kind of thing. Um, so this is uh, the backyard where I work. Uh, Woodland Dunes is, is right next to Lake Michigan, uh, just up the coast a little ways. Um, about 1,500 acres altogether. Uh, a lot of it's wetland. Uh, a lot of it is old ridges and swales that were formed when Lake Michigan was higher uh, and slowly dropped. Uh, but we have some meadows, uh, some uh, native grassland restorations that, that we've done and some wetland improvements. People have changed the landscape quite a bit over time. Um, and at this point, about 85% of the land in the world has been touched in one way or another by people, uh, influenced by people. Um, sometimes that's good, sometimes it's not so good. About 40% is now in agriculture, uh, and about 3% is urban. We think of urban areas as, as being like big problems, but uh, there isn't nearly as, as high a percentage of land in urban landscape. Some species of wildlife can adapt to live with us, and others have a much harder time doing that. Um, Wildlife species, uh, some of them are highly adapted to specific habitats. Uh, these are what uh, we call the conservative species. Uh, and I have an example is the Kirtland's warbler, which is uh, an extremely rare bird. Uh, although they found, it used to be that it only nested one place in Michigan. Now they found it in, in Wisconsin in half a dozen different places. Uh, where there are jack pine forests. Uh, unfortunately, the poor birds, they, they overwinter in the Bahamas and they just had a hurricane down there uh, in the fall. So I'm not sure how uh, their, ha their winter habitat is, is doing, but uh, they're a very conservative species. They really just need jack pine forest. Uh, kind of hard to reproduce that in your backyard. Um, there are generalists, um, and those are the ones that we're really familiar with. Uh, the, the ones that uh, have adaptations that allow them to use a lot of different habitats. So our backyard wildlife are, are often the generalists. Uh, a lot of times they benefit from the kind of disturbance that we do to the landscape. Um, I, I love the commercial, uh, what is it, the raccoons for progressive, and it's Shea Dumpster. Uh, uh, that's a good example of that. Uh, they can use various forms of food uh, and shelter. 
uh, and they're always looking at what we do to the land. Um, a simple kind of habitat would be a lawn. Uh, it's a little more complicated than this, but the, the basic components, you know, you've got your turf grass, which is often not native, uh, earthworms, which are not native. Um, then the, uh, the moth there is the, the sod webworm. Uh, they are a native species, uh, and they like what we did to lawns. Uh, so do those Canada geese. Um, they, uh, if you mow grass short and you mow it down to the edge of the water, uh, you've created just a wonderful situation for them. Um, the spider is a grass funnel web, another native uh, spider. Uh, and you'll see them, especially late summer, you see the little funnels all over in your grass when uh, they're all full of dew. Uh, they do just fine there. Flickers can find ants in the lawn. Uh, and of course, robins, uh, you know, short grass, and we introduced earthworms for them. Uh, so they tend to do pretty well. Uh, soil. Uh, is extremely important and most of the living things uh, that are in your yard are in the soil. Uh, just literally hundreds of thousands of species of bacteria and insects and everything else uh, that goes along with that. Insects in themselves are, are really important. If you read Doug Ptolemy's books, uh, he's an entomologist, uh, and he really focuses on the importance of insects, and they are the main way that energy gets transferred from the plants, which harvest it from the sun, uh, and distribute it all throughout the ecosystems. Uh, so insects are, are very important. Uh, they're finding that uh, in a lot of cases nowadays, insect populations are crashing. Uh, they don't always know why, uh, but they're very important. Uh, and they depend on native plants. Uh, a lot of times they don't know what to do with non-native plants. They haven't evolved with them. Uh, so planting native plants, even for the things that you don't see, is important. Birds, uh, I had to throw up a whole bunch of birds. We're, we're a, kind of a bird-focused uh, sanctuary, so we do bird banding and things like that, uh, and a lot of bird surveys. So uh, house finches are one that we introduced. Uh, they were originally from the west coast, and they were brought over uh, into the east coast and then they're working their way back. And I remember when there weren't any house finches. Until about 1980, I saw the first one uh, around here. Uh, goldfinches, robins, all those good backyard birds that come to our feeders and make winter worthwhile to me. Uh, the clinging uh, or uh, cavity nesting, woodpeckers and, and nuthatches, uh, things like that. Um, some of the others that aren't always so obvious, they do have, okay, there we go. Chipping sparrow, tree sparrow, we have tree sparrows. Does anyone have tree sparrows coming in their yard now? Good, that's a good good sign. Uh, they, they like brushy areas in the wintertime. Uh, and I'm always happy to see them. And the chipping sparrow is their close cousin. And if you notice in spring, around the 1st of April, the tree sparrows leave, chipping sparrows come in almost the same day. Um, kind of amazing. Good old juncos. Um, exciting birds. Uh, I guess we call them exciting. I call them exciting because they're colorful. Uh, but we're always uh, really happy when these visit our yard, uh, indigo bunting and redhead woodpecker. Do anyone have redheaded woodpeckers down here? But you're doing really well. Uh, it seemed like more of them showed up this this past year, and that used to be a real common bird around here. Uh, birdhouse birds, uh, the the ones that will be attracted to the birdhouses if you put them up. 
Um, birds that some people don't like, uh, the blackbirds, uh, we're kind of prejudiced against them. Uh, but in some cases, like the, the crows, they're, you know, really super intelligent birds. Uh, and uh, very interesting to watch. That's the only birds that come in in pairs to our yard at the nature center. And uh, one will look up at the windows to see if anyone is looking out and the other one will feed. And then they'll switch off. Um, so they, they really are aware of what's going on around them. Flyovers, uh, these are insect, insect eating birds, uh, chimney swifts, uh, have really declined. Uh, a lot of these, they call them aerial insectivores, uh, and their populations have kind of gone down with the insects uh, lately. Uh, some more that we don't always like to see in our yards. Uh, great horned owls are, are nesting right about now. Uh, probably are nesting now on a mild winter like this. Uh, and uh, Cooper's Hawk, uh, they visit our yard pretty regularly. One took a swipe at my little dog the other day. Um, a little more than he could handle though. Non-native birds, um, we've just had a pair of pigeons take up residence at the Nature Center. Not sure what to do about them. Starlings uh, are, you know, nobody really likes starlings. But they're another one that's intelligent and uh, are able to mimic songs uh, in an amazing way. Uh, Mozart had a pet starling and he would play his songs and the, the starling would sing back to him. Uh, so interesting birds. But maybe what's most important about Wisconsin is, is the migrating birds, uh, the ones that aren't here all the time. Uh, but that come through here. And if you, if you look at this, you can see there's, there's kind of some points that, where there are funnels uh, around the Great Lakes. Uh, these little songbirds don't like to fly over big bodies of water. So Duluth is a really good place uh, to see birds. Uh, a lot of them get funneled right through here. Wow, right by Sheboygan. Um, a lot of them come through here. Uh, there are certain points that are extremely good. And this is the Mississippi, Mississippi Flyway. And uh, these are the, the principal routes. Uh, and you can see this one actually, a lot of them are coming right down the coast of Lake Michigan. Uh, they use that as a sight line. Uh, to guide them north and south. Uh, so we see more birds along the lakeshore here than a lot of places. Uh, Mississippi River is another really good place uh, to see songbirds migrating. Uh, but it's important to protect habitat along these flyway routes. Uh, a lot of these little songbirds will migrate at night. Um, mostly because there's less turbulence in the air at night and it's, it's much more efficient for them to fly. Um, they also are less susceptible to predators uh, like hawks at night. Um, so they'll be up there and they will get up three to 5,000 feet uh, and they will be moving along the shore of, of Lake Michigan. And then when morning comes, uh, they're pretty well exhausted. They, they will fly 150 miles in a night. Uh, they need a place to sit down and feed and rest, uh, often for a couple days, uh, three, four days, uh, to build up enough reserves so that they can take off again and, and make another jump. Um, so wherever you can protect habitat, along these flyways uh, is doubly important. And here are some of the migrants. Uh, Canada warblers, one uh, that we have at, at the Nature Center in our preserve. Uh, Blackburnian warbler, white-throated sparrows also in our preserve, scarlet tanager. 
these two are, they nest farther north, um, but they're beautiful birds, so I had to throw them in. Um, we also see a lot about these. It's not just about birds, uh, but I don't know if you're like me, this is what my yard looks like. Um, I never knew that deer like to eat cucumber plants until I saw them walk up to our deck and pull some off. I think they'll basically try anything. Uh, rodents and lagomorphs, uh, there are a lot of different species also. Uh, little white-footed mice, uh, which is, I think there's more inside the nature center than there are outside right now. Uh, we're, we're catching a lot of them. Uh, meadow voles, uh, there can be a hundred meadow voles or more in an acre of land, uh, of meadow. Um, they're an extremely important prey species for other animals. Uh, the tree squirrels, we, uh, we know about those. Um, moles and shrews, there are more around than you realize. Uh, this is, a, let's see, this is the short-tailed shrew. Uh, this may be a masked shrew. Uh, Eastern mole, star-nosed mole, which doesn't hardly look like a mammal. Uh, but we see these little uh, mole hills a lot uh, in our preserve. The soil is kind of wet and they're, especially the last couple years, they're up close to the surface and they're tunneling right along and you see little bumps all over the place. And then the things that eat them. Uh, the weasels, uh, we, have, we have a lot of mink, we have marsh uh, around our, our headquarters, uh, and we have four species of weasels out there. Um, really interesting little animals, once in a while they find their way in the nature center. I, I should say, okay, the, the original nature center is a farmhouse that's like 150 years old, and it's got a stone foundation and there are places for critters to get in, unfortunately. Um, other animals, if, if you've ever been lucky, uh, our, uh, one of our staff and I were out doing a bird survey this last year and we ran across a skunk, uh, a female skunk, I'm sorry, possum, all full of young on her back, carrying them around. Uh, it was really cute. Um, and of course skunks and raccoons. Skunks are, they used to be considered a weasel, now they're kind of in their own family. Um, canine, canines, uh, we have both uh, red and gray fox. Uh, if you've ever seen a gray fox, I, I don't know if any animal is more graceful than they are. They just kind of glide through the forest. Uh, they have retractable claws uh, to some extent, like a cat. Uh, they, they're good climbers. Uh, they'll, they'll climb up trees and things like that. Um, coyotes uh, we have, uh, and they you know, increasingly come close to where people are and people don't always like that. Um, we, we think they're fine in our preserve. Uh, we like these uh, top predators to be there, um, but they're not everyone's preference, that's for sure. Uh, cats, uh, that, that's always, uh, they're an interesting subject because uh, they've done some really interesting work at University of Wisconsin. Um, if you extrapolate what cats eat, it's like a billion birds a year uh, in the United States. Uh, it's, it's better for the cats uh, to be indoors, uh, not only for smaller animals, but for the cats themselves. They live a lot longer um, and uh, end up with far fewer diseases and things like that. Uh, and we also have some native uh, cats. This, this was taken on a trail cam uh, not very far from our headquarters last winter. So uh, there are a few bobcats around too. Pollinators, 
um, rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, found one in our preserve. Uh, actually, each of the last two years, we f we found them, um, and they're an endangered bumblebee. Um, Bumblebees in general are, are having a hard time as are a lot of the native species of pollinators. Um, good old monarchs seem to have a good year. I don't know if they, if you saw them down here, but they, they really produced and they really migrated this past fall. Uh, and there are other species of bees uh, as well. This is a leaf cutter bee. Uh, Holictid bee, uh, they, they dig nests into the soil. Um, and it's kind of a surprise when you're digging a hole and you come up and there's these just emerald green shiny um, bees. Uh, usually it's early in the year, fortunately, and, and they aren't that aggressive. So some of the butterflies, uh, a good old monarch that's a female. Um, let's see, a question mark, eastern tiger swallowtail. Uh, there's also a Canadian tiger swallowtail that's a little bit smaller and a little more streaky. Uh, and our red, red admiral, which you can see really early in the year. Uh, and some pollinators that you don't typically think of, uh, solitary wasps, soldier beetles, um, this uh, carpenter bee, and hoverflies. Uh, if you look at asters in the fall, uh, a lot of times they'll be covered with hoverflies. Uh, and they're certainly transferring pollen back and forth as well. So bees, bees are important. Um, but there are a lot of other flies and other insects uh, that do pollination as well. So let's look at our backyards. Uh, usually it's a, a mix of lawn and tree, trees and shrubs, uh, resembles the edge of the forest. Um, and it's often a mix of native and non-native uh, plants. Uh, a lot of the non-native plants have been promoted. Um, it's good to bring in some native ones once in a while, and some of them are, are really good for landscaping. And you can see how much more diverse uh, this landscape is compared to uh, typical lawn. And of course, first you have to deal with invasive species often. Uh, and I hear you had just had someone talk about that. Uh, we do a lot of that at, at Dunes. Um, the, our preserve, uh, we're, we're 46 years old, about the first 30 years, nobody really thought about invasive species or managed them. So um, they got a really good hold and we have many hundreds of acres of things like uh, honeysuckle and buckthorn and autumn olive um, that uh, we are working on constantly uh, and then replacing those with native plants. Um, this time of year is a great time uh, to work on that. Uh, you, you can cut them. Um, we do treat the stumps with a little bit of herbicide. Um, compared to spraying herbicide all over the place uh, to get at the foliage, uh, we feel that treating the stumps is a much better alternative to that. Um, so we cut them, you know, six inches or less off the ground and then just treat that. You can also put a, plast a black plastic bag uh, over them if it's really thick uh, and they sell special bags for that and that will smother the the stumps. So if you don't have too many and you don't want to use herbicide, you can do that uh, and that will also kill the the invasives. Uh, we just have a much bigger scale that we work with. So native plants provide the the greatest benefit to wildlife. Um, they often require less care. 
they're not as fussy uh, once you get them going. Um, and then, you know, some non-natives provide some benefit to wildlife, uh, but you have to be careful that they're not something that's going to end up being invasive if you're bringing in a non-native. And they're, they're, they're really not as beneficial as a native plant. Many of them provide food for birds and other wildlife. Um, you know, that's including the nectar plants for pollinators. And then there are, you know, you can go on and on if you look at particular host plants for specific, say, insects, uh, monarchs, you know, like milkweeds of some sort. Um, you can go on and on. One of the big advantages to native plants is not only the, the fruit, say, that they produce, but also the insects that live on them uh, for, say, birds that eat insects. Uh, they know what species to go to to find insects. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, but non-natives or cultivars uh, don't have as many insects on them. Um, there's a really interesting book uh, that's available online. Um, it's, it's like how to landscape your property to help migratory birds by Vicki Piaskowski. She worked at the, um, at the zoo in Milwaukee. And she had these poor grad students that were taking clips of uh, branches and they would look at them and they would have to find every caterpillar. Uh, and often caterpillars, we think of colorful ones, but most of them are gray or brown and they're hugging the stem and they had to collect all these caterpillars and, and then they compared what species of shrub or tree had how many caterpillars on it. Uh, the natives were far greater in their number and diversity of caterpillars. Uh, and that's what warblers look for in the springtime. Having water around is also uh, really beneficial in the springtime. I refer to these warblers that, that come through. Um, in the springtime, most of them eat insects. In the fall, it's much more a mix of fruit and insects. Uh, but in spring, uh, there are a lot of insects hatching out of water bodies and things like that. Uh, another reason to follow the shore of Lake Michigan, uh, if you're going to migrate, because you get your food source right there. Um, but in fall, uh, in the warblers and vireos will eat fruit. Um, we've got some really interesting photographs of them doing that in our butterfly garden, uh, which is not what we expected. Uh, Water, uh, it's, it's good to have some water just uh, for the sake of allowing the birds to, to drink. Uh, the sound of flowing water attracts them um, and you want to do it in a way that uh, they don't drown. So not too steep or, or put some stones in it or something like that. Cover, uh, it's good to have some plants just for cover, uh, but there are some that provide both cover and food. Um, these are three that are good. Um, red cedar uh, is one that deer don't like. Um, it's an, an evergreen. You've heard of cedar wax wings. They eat the berries uh, off of these uh, junipers, uh, not only the, the upright red cedar, but some of the lower growing junipers as well. Red osier dogwood, uh, you probably have a lot of that around here. Um, that's a very good wildlife food. Um, it produces flowers in the springtime that pollinators like. Uh, just after that, a few weeks, uh, produces these horrible tasting white berries that wildlife just love. Um, 
they obviously have a different sense of taste than I do. Uh, <laughs> And in the wintertime, uh, deer, you know, will browse on that, and uh, it grows pretty aggressively, so it doesn't really hurt the, the red osier dogwood, but uh, deer will consume about eight pounds of dogwood twigs in a day. Um, so not that we have a shortage of deer, um, but this, this dogwood, a lot of times, because it's aggressive, people don't want it around. Um, but it actually is good uh, winter habitat for those kind of animals and nesting habitat for birds in the spring. And it's really easy to grow, especially if your soil is, is a little bit moist. Um, this is a white cedar. Uh, we used to have a lot more of those around, but the deer like them so much that we don't bother to plant them anymore as they just get eaten off. And, you know, we see under the mature white cedars, there's very little reproduction anymore. Oaks uh, are probably the, the number one wildlife species of tree, uh, not only for the nuts that they produce that feed all kinds of other things, but also, those caterpillars, uh, oaks, are susceptible to a lot of insects. Um, they don't kill the trees, but they host them. Uh, the, the oaks host these caterpillars, uh, and warblers especially like to go to oak trees um, in the springtime. So, and there are a number of, of species that, that grow. If you have a dry site, uh, red oaks, um, Burr oak is a kind of a classic prairie uh, oak, uh, and and we've got some really wet situations. We're planting a lot of swamp white oak. Um, mulberry. Uh, if you got neighbors that you don't like, plant a mulberry right <laughs> close to your property line. Um, we have a, a giant mulberry in the yard. Like I said, it's. Uh, our nature center is in an old farmhouse and they had an orchard. So there are a couple apple trees and a couple cherry trees and this giant mulberry tree and it bears every year and it's full of fruit and it's like a living bird feeder. Uh, it, the deck, we have a deck below it, it's all purple. Uh, it's a mess, uh, but when you see like indigo buntings come and eat the fruit and then come down and take a drink of water and cedar wax wings all the time and to us it's worth it. So there are some non-native uh, and invasive mulberries though and you have to watch out for red mulberry rubrum uh, is the, the one that's native to this area. Um, there's a white mulberry and there's another one uh, that's from Europe that you have to watch out for. Uh, red cedar that we talked about, those little cedar cones or berries, uh, that's cedar wax wings, really like those. Uh, but these are also really good cover. And if you want something that deer won't like, uh, they sure don't. This is, this is a lower growing one that my grandfather planted uh, just out, just off the edge of our yard. That's what it looks like this morning, all full of snow. But you can see how the birds can get under that and where the where the boughs of, of evergreens are thick like that and then there's some snow on, it can be 20 degrees warmer in there. Uh, so nights like tonight and tomorrow um, are are gonna be Important to have some of those kind of shrubs around. White spruce is, is a good one. Uh, it's a native spruce. Uh, again, deer don't like spruces that much. Uh, and it bears cones and does all the other good things that, that spruces do. But uh, unlike something like a white cedar, the deer don't, don't prefer it. Um, this is this is one, and, and there's this whole 
evolving train of thought uh, uh, now anticipating climate change uh, because some of these, and, and white spruce is one of them, uh, that like it kind of cold, and they may not do as well as something like a red cedar, which likes it warm uh, in the years to come. So they're, they're just starting to, to really parse all, uh, all of that out. Uh, there, the landscape, as far as the composition of trees, is probably going to change quite a bit. Viburnums are good. Um, these, these are in our butterfly garden. Uh, this is the uh, nanny berry. Uh, this is the uh, southern arrowwood, arrowwood or uh, they, they sell it as blue muffin uh, a lot of times. That's a pretty popular one that you can get pretty easily, um, at least a close cultivar uh, to the native. And then uh, the American highbush cranberry. There's American and, and European uh, highbush cranberries. European can be invasive. Uh, American is not so much. Uh, they leave the the red fruits often really late in the year, uh, and then they'll eat them in the spring. Um, it, it, they're they're kind of I don't know. Of course, they eat the dogwood berries, so I was going to say they're really sour, um, but I don't know if that makes that much difference to birds. Uh, these, though, I, I've, that's uh, one that we've seen the warblers and the vireos eating, uh, and they don't last very long in the fall. Um, nine bark uh, is, is one that gets tiny little seeds. You really don't notice them so much, uh, but they're good cover. Uh, we have those planted next to our bird feeders uh, at the Nature Center, uh, and birds are in there all the time. Uh, and chokeberry is is one also that uh, uh, is pretty easy to grow, uh, and those berries don't last very long into the fall. Uh, something eats them. And service berry is is uh, those berries go even faster. I've heard they make good jam and everything, but I never get any. Uh, the birds are way ahead of me. Uh, hawthorns, uh, you know, there are a lot of hawthorns planted now. That's that's probably a good thing. Um, not only the cover, but also the fruits uh, that hang on there in the fall. Thorn apples, we always called them when I was a kid. Um, same for the crab apples. Uh, they aren't strictly native, uh, but there are some varieties of that species that are are native. Uh, and uh, again, the the pollinators like them when they bloom, and uh, birds eventually eat the fruit in the fall. Um, if you have a lot of uh, crab apples around. Uh, often that's where robins hang out in the winter time. Some robins stay all winter, uh, and uh, that's usually what they're around. And then the the things for pollinators. Um, this is the um, uh, Canada goldenrod. Uh, it's a common, aggressive goldenrod. Uh, like a weed, um, they are a native plant. Pollinators do benefit from them. Uh, you know, people ask me because they don't like their whole flower garden to be goldenrod. Uh, you can pull them out. You know, you can transplant them or you can just pull them out and uh, just leave a few uh, for the insects. Uh, Leatris, uh, you're probably familiar with a lot of things. Uh, butterflies, boy, monarchs in the in the late summer love Leatris. Uh, doesn't seem to matter that much what species it is, uh, and there are several. 
uh, milkweeds. Uh, there are more than a dozen different species of milkweeds in Wisconsin. We're used to seeing the common milkweed uh, or the butterfly weed. You know, they sell a lot of that. These little, this is a world milkweed uh, that grows in places uh, kind of like gravel pits. Uh, it, it likes poor soil, sandy or gravelly soil, uh, only gets about that tall. Um, you wouldn't even think it's a milkweed, uh, but it's very beneficial. Um, yeah, and then common milkweed and, and the swamp milkweed uh, looks a lot like that with darker flowers. Some of the purples, uh, the bergamot is really easy to grow. Um, I have spread that all over my property around my house uh, just by collecting seed heads and just throwing them out there. Uh, tiny little seeds, it's a mint. Deer don't like it that much. Deer don't like uh, things that smell strong, it seems. Uh, and that's why the mints have such a strong smell to deter uh, animals that might graze on them. Uh, and then jo uh, Joe Pieweed uh, grows in wet areas. Uh, we have just native patches around the nature center. That's really popular with monarchs as well. Uh, they really like that. Primrose. Uh, is one that's easy to grow. Ironweed is an interesting plant. Uh, well, we found, okay, naturally ironweed is, you know, like that tall, but if you put it in a garden and take care of it, all of a sudden it's eight feet tall. <laughs> so, but you can look at the butterflies up there and they're pretty, it's a really dark purple uh, compared to like Joe Pieweed or something like that. Coreopsis uh, is is one. Uh, I don't I don't know that it's as beneficial to pollinators, but it uh, certainly mm -hmm. looks nice early in the summer, uh, like June, before other things get going. Uh, mountain mint and penstemon. Uh, penstemon is is really popular with insects um, and really easy to grow. Uh, once you establish a, a clump of it, it spreads on its own. And these, these mints all seem to be very prolific. Uh, having some willows, uh, some of the smaller willow trees, uh, they bloom so early. Um, a lot of times they're blooming when the first bumblebees emerge from their burrows. Um, bumblebees have interesting life cycles in that the, the queens are the only ones that uh, find a burrow, survive the winter underground, and then come out really early in the spring and try to get a colony established. And uh, you'll see them on these willows um, because there's really just a few things blooming, dandelions and, and, and things like that. Um, so it's good to have a couple of those. We have, we have lots of them just growing wild at the Nature Center. Uh, more mints. Uh, this is Culver's Root. Um, that's another one that doesn't bloom a long time, but the pollinators really seem to like it. And, you know, when I talk about pollinators, it's not necessarily big showy butterflies, but it's all kinds of other insects. Uh, it's interesting just to see all the little things, little flies and things that are in there. In the fall, then we've got asters, uh, and one of my favorite times of year. Uh, there are a number of species of asters, and some of them are pretty hard to tell apart from each other. Uh, the, the white ones, uh, calico aster and heath aster and things like that, panicled aster, uh, but they are all popular, popular with pollinators. Uh, New England aster is, you know, one of my favorites. Um, 
just because they look so nice in, on the landscape. Sunflowers, there are a lot of uh, different kinds. Uh, the Black eyed Susans, brown eyed Susans, the uh, downy sunflower. Um, this is cup plant, um, and that's, that's a really interesting species that that uh, can be another one that you plant some and then you go, oh no, in about five years you've got this forest of cup plants out there. Um, but they, uh, they provide forage for animals like deer. Uh, they produce these little sunflowers. Uh, they have they call them cup plants because the leaves come together and they hold water. You'll see the goldfinches come and drink out of there. Um, you'll see pollinators all over the flowers and then later on uh, they produce like little sunflower seeds and then the goldfinches are back at them again. And the goldfinches just seem to watch for that right moment and then they're, they just pounce on these plants. Cone flowers, uh, there are quite a few. The, the purple cone flower is actually native to the south of Wisconsin, uh, but they, they do well uh, in a lot of situations here. And I think that may be another species that if it's warmer, they're probably gonna do just fine up here. Uh, the Leatris, uh, there's a couple different species. I think this is meadow blazing star and this is a rough blazing star. It's got these little knobs on it. Uh, this, this is one that monarchs really like. So in general, um, for trees and shrubs, um, pay close attention to the, to the soil, uh, what the soil is telling you. Uh, how wet the soil is, or dry, or if it's silty, or if it's sandy, uh, or gravelly. Um, make your hole wide enough. Uh, native plants, there's little need to fertilize. They just don't need a lot. In fact, too much fertilizer for native plants uh, sometimes will uh, be to their detriment. Um, but the first year, uh, you know, you've got to keep them reasonably moist. Um, please pay attention to power lines. Uh, there are a lot of trees that are, are planted too close to power lines and then they end up getting pruned in really interesting ways. <laughs> For the native grasses and wildflowers, um, it's good to prepare the soil bed uh, to limit competition. There are so many non-native uh, grasses and things like that. Um, and there's a lot of different ways you can cultivate it, uh, your plot, you can spread black plastic over it, let it for a year. Uh, to bake the soil, to bake the seeds that are in the soil. Because uh, oftentimes after generations, there's a, a bed of seeds that's built up in the soil and some of those aren't going to germinate right away. Um, th they can wait for years and years uh, and then ge germinate. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you get rid of them. Some people use herbicides to do that, but you still have to do that multiple times um, as each of these generations of seeds grow. Um, sowing in early spring or late, late fall is good. Even winter is good. Uh, if you, um, a few weeks ago when we lost our snow cover, uh, that was a great time to, just broadcast um, native prairie seed. Uh, 
it, it gets down, if it snows on top of it, as the snow melts, it incorporates it into that upper layer of soil. Um, it's very natural. If you think about native plants, a lot of them shed their seeds in the fall. Uh, that's when they're meant to be out there and go through cold uh, and then germinate in the spring. Um, so we do a lot of that. Uh, you have to be patient with native plants, uh, especially these, these native flowers, because they'll take years uh, to establish. They grow enormous root systems in some cases, um, and it takes three or four years for the, all those roots uh, to grow. But then when that's set, the, the plant has a really good foundation, and then the plants really take off. Um, and then they bloom. Um, and if you're trying to encourage bees, um, you know, the ground nesting bees, like those little green guys, um, they like some bare soil. Uh, they, they don't like everything thickly vegetated. They like a place to dig. Um, so having some patches of gray soil, uh, it's mostly a matter of not planting the seed too densely together um, to allow for those bare spots. There's a lot of places that you can get uh, seedling trees, native trees now, fortunately. Um, and even garden centers, uh, sometimes you have, to, you have to look for a while, but you can occasionally find larger specimens that uh, are native species. And for the native wildflowers, there are a ton of places now. Uh, you probably, you know, know much more about what's in this area. Um, the, but there are a lot, um, a lot of places you can get seed uh, online. Um, what you don't necessarily want to get are the. Um, hummingbird mix or the wildflower mix uh, that's really cheap, um, that's sometimes in like a department store. Um, a lot of times those will have non-native plants. They're wildflowers somewhere, but not uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, they, don't, they don't do nearly as much good as uh, just buying a really good quality native plant mix for this region. Um, you don't want to take wildflowers from public lands. Uh, and uh, you, do you have a wild ones chapter down here? No. Um, uh, they have several chapters. We don't in Manitowoc, Two Rivers either. But they will uh, rescue, they'll get permission and rescue plants. Um, and the members can take them and plant them. So wildlife, you know, you want to you want to think about food, water and shelter, native plants. Uh, did I say that like a hundred times? Uh, a varied structure, you know, some tall, some short, uh, variety, uh, and, and then uh, flowers for the pollinators. And when you put it all together, uh, Hopefully, you have something like this to enjoy in your yard. Now, th this one, I'm not sure that the neighbors appreciate this one. Um, it's certainly interesting habitat. Um, there's a lot of zinnias in there too and stuff, but yeah, I'm not, not sure how that would go over. But uh, some people, and you can, you know, on the internet, you can find so many examples of wonderful, creative things that people have done, much more creative than I am. Uh, this is, uh, these are a couple of the uh, references uh, that I look at. Uh, Birdscaping by Marriott Nowak. Um, and I didn't even put Doug Ptolemy's book on here. Um, that's an omission on my part, but um, Bringing Nature Home, uh, really good book. Uh, 
he really breaks down what insects use, what native plants, and, and things like that. So, and that's what I have. So, if, if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you. Yes, thanks.